Hi, friends. Welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. This is John Kempf. And as you know, normally on this podcast, or frequently, we speak about the uh, an agronomic orientation to regenerative agriculture. What does it take to produce really healthy soil, really healthy plants, and ultimately, really healthy people and farm economics? The conversation I'm hoping to have today is addresses perhaps some of the philosophical underpinnings and foundations of what really defines regeneration and what is the place that we need to come from within to really embrace and embody regeneration of landscapes. I'm really pleased and honored to have Charles Eisenstein here with me as a guest today. Uh, I've admired Charles' work for quite some time. And, uh, you know, Charles, I want to say thank you for being here and uh, for being willing to share your wisdom. You've done a lot of heavy lifting over the last well, decades really, but particularly the last couple of years, there's been uh, lots of, um, I don't know what the right word is, insanity maybe, lots of craziness in the world. And there is a need for voices of clarity and voices of thought who are able to articulate what's really going on in the world from a, perhaps from a spiritual perspective or a philosophical perspective of where is the place that we're really coming from within. So thank you for being here. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. Thank you, John, for having me on. I'm uh... Uh, flattered and honored to be on on your show. You know, well, you're most welcome. I don't know if you need to be flattered and honored, but um, I think um, one of the pieces I wanted to discuss with you and, and get your perspective on, we have, in, in many ways, we have, our, our contemporary agriculture has really drifted far away to almost 180 degrees opposite of the principles and values that attracted most of us into farming in the first place. When I have conversations with growers and I and I ask people the question, I, I include myself in this, I grew up on a farm, and I ask the question, what is it that really attracts us to farming? What is it that attracts us to working with rural landscapes? And the reality is it's a difficult job. It's hard work. It's frequently relatively low paying compared to other um, jobs that you might take in the marketplace. So why do we sign up for this? And when you really dig into the answers and uh, into the ethos that is at the foundation of those answers, what it seems to come down to is that many of us are attracted to this space because of our desire for a connection with life and living processes. We want to be good stewards. We want to nurture life. We get joy from uh, watching seedlings emerge in the spring and from watching the joy of newborn animals. And yet, somehow, in our contemporary agriculture, we've adopted a model of agriculture that is, in some ways, the direct antithesis of that, where we have this warfare mentality of search and destroy, identify specific pathogens, identify specific pests, and figure out how you can wipe them off the face of the earth. And if the first weapon of choice isn't successful, then we just simply follow up with a bigger bomb the second time around. How have we gotten so far away from that inner those inner core values that attracted us to agriculture in the first place and what's our pathway back to reconciling that yeah like like you say it's really become a war on nature uh you're speaking of herbicides pesticides or basically the domination of the land so that only one thing can grow there only the things that you want to grow and this has been you know where do, if you if you ask where did this begin, you have to go back many, many centuries, where in contrast to, say, hunter-gatherers who didn't raise animals, they didn't plant crops, the farmer chooses what will grow here and what will not grow there, and chooses which animals will thrive and which will not, which ones are good and which ones are bad. So this basic concept of good and evil arose with agriculture. For example, the corn is good. It's a sacred plant, but the burdock or the pigweed or whatever else is growing there is bad. The sheep is good. The wolf is bad, the big bad wolf. Once you identify it in that way, then the crusade for good becomes a matter of extinguishing the weeds, the insects, the wolves, and so forth. And that is what has intensified over thousands of years. What we're learning today is what some farmers have always known, 
which is that this endless war breeds the necessity for even more of it, like you were saying, a bigger bomb. And somehow the promised paradise of only the good existing, it never comes. <laughs> and, and also the, the external killing, the simplification of ecosystems, the conversion of soil from a living being into a mere medium for plant growth, all of that killing corresponds to an inner killing. Every time the land around you is simplified, every time a bird species disappears, something inside of you dies as well. I was feeling this just the other day when I was out cutting my grass uh, and there was, there, were all, there was all this clover, like just this rich, rich carpet of clover all over my lawn. And I noticed that there were no honeybees and no other bees and no wasps and like almost no insects. And I just felt, it just really hit me, you know, this feeling of being alone now. Cause I remember when I was a kid, like you couldn't even walk barefoot through, a, through the lawn, you know, cause you'd get stung by bees. There were so many of them and butterflies, those like little yellow ones, the little white ones, you know, the monarchs, nothing. And I think, you know, I'm sure that a lot of farmers, I know this is a fact, when they compare the land that they farm, you know, I'm speaking of conventional farmers, to the land that they knew when they were kids, you know, that their grandfather farmed or their great grandfather, there's a sadness that maybe they hardly even allow themselves to feel because it's crushed under the daily pressures of, you know, making it economically. But this yearning to return to life is present not only in farmers, but in everybody, you know, all these kids growing up indoors on their electronics. Yep. Yeah. You know, maybe because farmers are still more in touch with the outdoors and more directly involved in the process of life, maybe just as initially they led the way away from embedment in nature Maybe they also lead the way back, you know, because I don't think the leadership is going to come from kids growing up playing video games. They don't even know what they've lost. They have, you know, chronic disease rates now, depression, anxiety, ADHD, all these psychiatric conditions through the roof, you know, like they're just miserable now. My wife just went to her college reunion and their, her 30th reunion and the college president said that half the student body has clinical depression. Wow. So like, why, you know, what's going on here? And I think a lot of it is disconnection. If you're alone, I mean, that's like, the UN defines that as torture, you know, to put somebody in solitary confinement, to cut off all their relations. Well, we've been doing that. And, and that nourishment, like that little lilt of joy that you feel when you see a bluebird, you know, or a fox. I mean, imagine that's all gone and you don't even know what you've lost. That's the condition of our society. And yeah, so it's a thousands of years story. When you relate the story of uh, observing the, the loss of insects, butterflies and honeybees in your yard, one of the things that I really have a connection to growing up was the abundance of fireflies. You used to be able to look out over fields and there would be this sparkling show of being able to see thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of fireflies at any given moment over a landscape of uh, a few hundred yards. And today, and I'm not that old, this is 20 years later, 20 years later, you don't see that. I mean, I, I live... I have the privilege of uh, having a home where I'm surrounded by state hunting land. There are no ag pesticides that get sprayed anywhere within two miles of where I live. And even here, we have a very limited firefly population. It's, uh, it's less than 5% of what I remember growing up 20 years ago. So I feel that sense of loss quite keenly in that personal setting as well. And so I'd love for you to elaborate a bit more on your thoughts around an, an inner dying or an inner killing when when you're thinking about that what uh, what is it that dies inside of us you know none of us exist 
in isolation. Even the word exist, it kind of implies that who you are is independent of all that is. But in fact, we are actually beings of relationship. So when any relationship, I mean, you feel this if a, if a loved one passes away, you know, it really feels like something in you has also passed away. You become less in a way. And that emptiness then maybe can be filled by new relationships. You know, the parents die, but the grandchildren come, you know, something like that. But something changes. You are no longer who you once were. So it's not just human relationships that give us a sense of being here, of being in the world. It's all of our relationships. So traditionally, we lived in a wealth of relationships. We were surrounded by not just our nuclear family, but an extended network of kin. And the kin were, were human kin, cousins, uncles, aunts, second cousins, you know, uh, and but also our natural kin, our non-human kin, plants and animals. And you go outside, and I don't know, maybe you even grew up like this, where most people that you saw day to day and week to week were known to you. You knew their stories. You could place them in a social yes, network. Oh, that's, you know, my friend's cousin. You know, I know him. And also the, the plants and animals were known to you. Maybe you could name them all. Maybe you could name every tree on your property. Maybe you knew what every plant was for, or at least whether it was a weed and what its name was and how it grew. Like you had maybe some of that growing up, a lot more than most people had probably in this society. But even what you had is probably less than what a Native American had 500 years ago. But still, because you had a rich and complex relationships with many, many people, you had a sense of being, a sense of belonging. And, you know, for good or ill, it's not like necessarily all these relationships were good uh, or all these people were kind, but they defined a social universe. So when people now are living in a world only of a few intimate relationships, their immediate family, and a sea of strangers, and in recent years, this is intensified to the point where you don't even get to be physically present with the strangers. Right. You know, all of the interactions are mediated by technology. Then people feel like they're not fully existing in the world. They feel alienated. They feel uh, like they don't belong. They're not actually fully here. And I think that that poverty of being leads to a lot of our psychiatric and social ills, including like political polarization and cults and conspiracy theories and fundamentalism, you know, where, where people, because they don't know who they are through relationship, they very readily associate with a political ideology that tells them, here's who you are. Here are the good guys. Here are the bad guys. Here's self, here's other, here's home, here's the foreign territory. And it all comes from the dissolving of human and other than human community. You know, as, as I've uh, grown older, I'm still a young man, but I, I had the privilege of growing up in a community that has extremely strong family and community values. And it's actually, it's actually been... Uh, hearing you describe this makes me uh, twinge a little bit because uh, a source of uh, personal frustration has been that people within the community are identified by who their families are. Like uh, going into a new part of the community or to another Amish community, the first question is always, who's your family? And immediately, oh yeah, I know your second cousin twice removed, that there's these all these uh, community connections and relationships that, that uh, are extrapolated. And I, I think the um, the point that has um, I've found as a bit of a personal annoyance is that is then the assumption that because you know the family, you know the person, you know the individual, and uh, that has really that can preclude the development of a deeper relationship if you immediately assume that you then know someone or something. And what this reminds me of is this conversation reminds me of is the 
I forget even, I, I don't know the proper name for it, but what uh, I just referred to as the Harvard study on longevity. It's been written about quite a bit. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but where they identified that the single factor that correlates to quality of life and length of life and longevity is the depth and quality of our personal relationships with family and then also with extended community. And so when we think about, as you're describing how, how this has generally been lost in culture and society at large, what is the pathway for us regaining that and reappreciating that, particularly in the agricultural domain? Well, maybe I'll start with, uh, at the beginning of what you just said, you said you had the privilege of growing up in a strong community. And I just kind of landed on the word privilege there, because ordinarily, and maybe I would replace it with the word blessing, yep. the blessing of growing up like yep. that. But it's funny because privilege generally, in the way that people normally use it, it does not include that at all. Basically, a privileged person is somebody who, in fact, doesn't have or doesn't need community because they can meet all of their needs with money. Interesting. Yeah. So because if you have enough money in modern society, you don't need anybody or any, anyone or anything. You don't need the people around you because you could pay somebody else to do whatever they're doing. You don't need the ecosystem around you. You don't need the soil around you because you can pay to import food from somewhere else. You're completely independent of your relationships, except for the one relationship, the one relationship that matters in modern society which to, to sustain life, which is money, or so it seems. But as the study you cite demonstrates, it's not actually true that we can meet all of our needs with money. But what money does is it replaces human relationships. So in an Amish community, there's no such thing, as far as I know, as insurance on your home. Because if your home burns down, the community will get together and build you a new home. That's your insurance. Exactly. And your insurance payment is all the times that you helped somebody else build their house. So you don't need insurance in that community. Well, any society that lives in that way is a ripe target for development, as it's called, for economic growth, because you can replace that community function with a paid service. And so what's happened in the modern era is that one after another of human relationships have been replaced with paid services, everything from growing food to taking care of children to making entertainment. You know, it's not just the survival needs. It's also what, what does it take to live well, to be fully human? And if you don't make your own music anymore, but you download it from Spotify, then that's another service that has been converted into money. And also ecological services get converted into something that you purchase. And so that strips away what actually makes life rich. So you ask what to do about it. I mean, on the broadest level, it's to reclaim, to restore, to recover, to regenerate the lost relationships, to come into relationship again, and to see, see privilege or progress I mean, privilege, let's not use that word really, because that has to do with special dispensations that are meted out by authority, you know, and unless we're speaking of divine authority, we probably shouldn't use the word privilege, but to reclaim, so to turn that idea on its head and say, and embrace the knowledge of what actually makes life rich, what makes life good, and to say, okay, it's time to enrich ourselves again. It's time to reclaim the lost relationships. So farmers can do that in many ways. And they kind of seem separate, like, okay, an ecological farm, regenerating soil, increasing biodiversity, healing the aquifer, you know, building, building the water table, having closed cycles on the farm, you know, like all these different principles that restores relationships in one way. But also, there's the human relationships, there's the community relationships, and the whole idea of a single farmer or a farm family with their own private property running their own farm, and then, you know, some the next neighbor runs their own farm and the other one runs their own farm, you know, it still keeps us separate from each other. And, and you know, most rural communities, 
haven't quite devolved to that level. Like farmers still, they'll borrow stuff from each other. Like they still have relationships. They might help each other out in a pinch. You know, I was just at a, a family gathering. My sister-in-law passed away. My brother's a farmer and I was staying at his place. And because of all that was going on that day, I forgot to water the greenhouse, which he asked me to do. And here we were an hour away and he's like, watered the greenhouse, right? And I was like, oh, like I literally put my hand to my mouth. But that was okay. He just made a couple phone calls and that's a kind of a community that still exists in rural areas. But I mean, compared to what you're describing growing up Amish, you know. So anyway, so like, what can we do about it? It's, it's to rebuild these relationships. I would like to talk also about what you said about how it can freeze you in the definition of you that a community has. When I think about uh, rebuilding relationships and, and what you have just described, I've described that regeneration, we, we, we are calling this, um, this movement or this revolution in, in agricultural thought, regenerative agriculture. And when we think about regeneration, I've described that the fundamental of regeneration is fundamentally about regenerating relationships, relationships between livestock and the landscape, relationships between plants and soil microbes. It's at, at all levels, it's about regenerating relationships, including our relationships with the landscape, our relationships inside the community. And to some degree, I think this is obvious for us within our hearts. Like we, we instinctively, intuitively recognize the truth in this and we can embrace it. But one of the pieces that is perhaps less obvious for, for some is how do we rebuild relationships, particularly with the plants that, I'll, I'll focus on plants for the moment, with plants that are undomesticated. So it's easy for us to think about, okay, well, I need to think more deeply about the relationships with my livestock and with the crops that I'm growing and really tap into what is it that they're really looking for? What is it that they really need? But Actually, it's it's bigger than that. We also need to specifically develop our relationships with the plants that we like to call weeds and with the organisms that we like to call diseases and that we like to call pests. Uh, I really I really dislike the terminology of pests and pathogens because that automatically defines our relationships in a negative frame. And so I'm curious about your thoughts of how do we, what's the pathway for rebuilding and reclaiming relationships with quote unquote, undomesticated or wild organisms? Yeah, I'm sure that you're well aware that there are all kinds of uh, brilliant agronomists and farmers and, and people who understand so-called pests in a different way. Something we speak about frequently here on the podcast, yes. Yeah, so you know they look at they look at the weeds or diseases on a farm, and they say, "Oh, okay, this means that your soil is low in magnesium or something like that," and see it as an organism, where each species has its proper place in the web of relationship. And when one of them proliferates to an unusual degree, that means that something is out of balance. That doesn't mean, though, that we just let nature take its course because we're part of the balance as well. And through our interventions, you know, we can change the balance, but it's not, but without disrupting the balance, we can move into a new balance that includes ourselves and that meets our own needs. The Native Americans did this with their tending the wild, uh, as it was called you know, with controlled burns and maybe coppicing certain trees, you know, and, and these interventions that were not obvious to the European settlers, but that kept the land in a state of heightened productivity. Productivity meaning things that are useful to human beings. So like a lot of, like a lot more oak trees and acorns than would have otherwise been if they hadn't intervened. So that requires, to be able to do that requires to really listen to the land, to be very intimately familiar with it over years, decades, and generations, to be able to see or to sense what the next balance could be. Like, what is the dream of the land? What is a 
robust relational future that includes human beings. And, you know, there's no shortcut to do that. To, to really do that well, you have to be in, in really intimate relationship over a long period of time. This is such a key point, Charles, and I think this, this speaks to fundamental differences in, in the way people view the role of humans in the landscape, that there's this one paradigm, this one worldview uh, that's frequently held by environmentalists to say that humans are a blight on the landscape and that if we want to rewild or to regenerate natural ecosystems, then the best pathway to do that is to remove humans from the landscape. Yeah. And then there's this other point of view that which we hold that people are this hyper keystone species and that by having a loving, caring stewardship relationship with the land and with ecosystems, that we have the capacity to regenerate ecosystems far more rapidly than uh, and more effectively. And, and I would argue that it's I'm of the persuasion that when we steward landscapes for our own benefit, it ends up not just benefiting humans, but it benefits the entire ecosystem. Yes. And that only happens when we really understand what our benefit is. What benefits us is not necessarily to, to maximize the yield of calories and produce that stores and ships well. When I pick strawberries at my brother's farm with my son, who's now 10, I always comment on, you know, when we pick that strawberry, you know, when you eat a strawberry that's, that's still warm from the sun, it tastes different than it does if you take that same strawberry and put it in the refrigerator and eat it even one day later. And I say to him, this experience right now is something that money literally cannot buy. You have to actually bend over and pick it yourself. You have to actually be present in a field. All of Bill Gates' money cannot buy him this moment. This is what real wealth is. When we understand what real wealth is, then the benefit of man and the benefit of nature are no longer in conflict. So, yes. So what you're saying is true. We just have to understand what, like what a good life actually is. And also, you know, this, this debate, you know, maybe the humans are a blight on the planet. Maybe Earth would be better off without us. Like that is such an insult to creation and the creator. Whether you believe, you know, in the Christian God or something else, <laughs> the idea that creator just made a big mistake and created a species that, unlike every other species on Earth, is a burden on the planet. Every species increases the amount of life around it. What is an interesting internal conflict is that I find that many of the people who believe that the planet would be better off or who profess to believe the planet would be better off without people are the same people who believe that we need to give a much higher degree of credit and value to indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. Those two strike me as being in direct conflict. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is something that indigenous people, I think, mostly understood, you know, that we are among all of our brother and sister species here with a common purpose, which is to make the world even more alive. Every species makes the world more alive. You know, the pollinators help the plants, the plants help the fungi, the fungi help the bacteria, the bacteria then help the plants again. I mean, it's all a circle of blessings, a circle of gifts. That's what ecology is. It's a circle of gifts. Hmm. And you know, you take away one species, you take away the whales, and that does not mean that the krill is better off. You'd think, well, you know, it'll be awesome for the krill if all the baleen whales disappear because they're eating the krill. But actually, when you take away the whales, the population of krill plummets because the whales are no longer bringing up nutrients from the deep ocean that feed the plankton, that feed the bigger plankton, that feed the krill. So populations of krill plummet. So every species makes the world more alive, has a gift to bring. And humans were created no differently. We just don't understand that that's what our purpose is right now. You know, when you speak about bringing gifts and this circle of blessings, what popped into my mind was the golden rule and how the golden rule is so commonly misunderstood. When I asked people 
explained the golden rule to me as if though I were six, uh, as you would explain it to a little child. The vast majority of the time, people will say something like, don't do things to other people that you don't want to do to them. If you don't want someone to punch you in the face, you don't punch someone else in the face. That's their description of the golden rule. But in fact, that's not what the golden rule says at all. That framing of don't punch someone else in the face because you don't want to be punched in the face is a negative framing and it's a passive framing. You cannot do uh, things to other people by isolating yourself in a cell completely disassociated from society. But in fact, what the golden rule says is do unto others what you would have them do unto you. You can't do that passively. That's not passive. That is active and it's positive. You have to go out and engage. So that's what that brings to mind when you think about bringing gifts uh, and having this circle of gifts is that's really an expression of the golden rule. You have to bring to others. And that doesn't just mean people. It means everything else, all these other relationships. Yeah. And I think there's even another level of the golden rule, which isn't a rule as much as a promise uh, or as a declaration of the way that things are, which is, as you do unto others, so shall be done unto you. Or as you do unto others, you also do unto yourself. Yes. Because, for example, when we deplete the landscape, there's an inner depletion as well. When our country goes abroad and bombs people and drones people and regime changes people and invades people, you know, and, and wages violence all over the planet. The violence creeps in to Fortress America. Inevitably, it's not that we get attacked by a foreign country necessarily, but we have domestic violence in the home. We have civil violence in the streets. It's a mirror and it demonstrates this other this other dimension of the golden rule, which is what goes around comes around, you know? So yeah, when we understand ourselves as beings of relationship, then it is inevitable that what we do unto others will be done unto ourselves because the others aren't really separate from ourselves. This reminds me of a, uh, a parallel concept that one of my friends shared with me when um, attempting to learn about others, understand others, develop deep relationships. We were having a conversation about how how do you learn to know the inner state of someone else, the inner state of being and where they are, where they are coming from within. And he made this comment that struck me as being quite profound. He said, when you want to understand a person's inner landscape, it's actually quite easy. You just observe their outer landscape because their outer life will always be a reflection of their state within. Yeah, that is definitely coming from the same understanding. So earlier we were speaking about how we are perceived within a community, and I was sharing my thoughts about uh, being defined in a community by association with family, and you had some thoughts you wanted to share around that. Yeah. For a community to be truly healthy and vibrant, I think that there has to be also room for individuation and to claim your uniqueness in the world. Some cultures have initiations, vision quests, you know, coming of age ordeals where you go through a passage and discover who you are outside of the relationships that had defined you your whole life. Maybe you go on some kind of journey. Young people naturally are drawn to that kind of experience. When you're in your late teens, early 20s, you know, you want to travel, you want to get away from home. And there's a wisdom in that. Something in you seeks expression that can be held back when everybody around you thinks they already know who you are. You know, you have to actually, and this is all in all the fairy tales, you know, you, have, you go on some kind of journey or some kind of quest. A society can err on one side by disallowing that journey of self-discovery. Our society errs on the other side, which is once you go out and establish your individuality, there's no community to come back to. There's, there's supposed to be a return journey and the integration of who you have discovered yourself to be in a community that recognizes that something profound has happened, that you are no longer who you were. And so the return is a process of integrating your newfound individuality and gifts back into the community 
and the community trying to understand now, who is this person and what are they for? And there might already be many indications of that. It's not like you've completely changed from your childhood, but that the society needs to have an expectation that something new has developed and really is curious to get to know you again. And I think some, I mean, you would know much better than I would, but I think that some, some segments of Amish society do have room for this kind of external journey and return. And that is what keeps the society vibrant. Yeah, otherwise it'll get moribund and ossified, you know, it'll get paralyzed. Hmm. This is, this is a fascinating conversation, Charles, and it's given me a lot of introspection. I think um, within, the, within the context of the Amish communities, there's lots of variation. I mean, certainly within some communities, there's, there's room for that, and, and within many, there are not. And, you know, your, your observation or your prediction is quite accurate that for those communities for which that pathway or that, I guess, suppose you could say that pathway doesn't really exist, uh, both for exploration and or for return, but really for exploration, um, that uh, it does lead to lots of stagnation and community conflict over time. I see it repeating. I see that pattern very clearly. Yeah. Stagnation is the word I was looking for. Yeah. And it's kind of a paradox, like in order to maintain the community sustainably in the long term, you have to be able to let go of people and trust that they will return. And if they don't return, that's okay too. But over the long term, what seems, this is so often true in life, you know, what seems like a, like a risk, like a letting go of control, actually it's, you know, it's, it's kind of, again, trusting creator, you know, that there's an intelligence operating beyond your own and you don't have to control everything. This applies to agriculture too. You know, it's, it's the same paradigm that you'll have a more productive farm if you can control every variable. There's an intelligence in creation. Creation isn't separate from creator. There's an intelligence in soil. There's an intelligence in, in ecosystems. And we can participate in that intelligence without having to control everything that goes on. It's a position of humility which actually is almost a synonym for soil, <laughs> humus. You know, that's, that's the, the repository of all of this knowledge. When you think about control, what is the juxtaposition or, or what, is the, um, what are the parallels and the contrasts between control and responsibility? When I think about responsibility, when we think about our responsibility as stewards of the landscape, I find that many of the people who embrace this inner journey and then this outward journey of changing their relationships with the landscape responsibility is both extremely empowering while simultaneously extremely intimidating and to some degree it almost requires a, a degree of comfort with not feeling in completely in control yeah you know what what is what is responsibility you know a distorted understanding of the word is, well, it's the things you're supposed to do to be a good person. And if you don't do them, then you're irresponsible. You're a bad person. But you could also take it to mean the ability to respond and maybe the ability to respond well. To respond, you have to first listen and watch and witness so that you know what you are responding to. That is what gives you the ability to respond. And then there are also the skills that are developed in relationship, the skills of a farmer, the skills of whatever you're, you're engaged with. So if you understand that there is an, an intelligence in the world outside of ourselves, then creation can happen through you, through your response, through your responding to the conditions. Because... You don't have to be able to plan everything out. You don't have to know everything. All you have to do is know what is yours to do. And that is a response to what's happening around mm -hmm. you. Okay, yeah, now I know what is mine to do. Does that make sense? It does. And it's, uh, it's an interesting, um, the framing that I get from um, some growers in the contemporary ag community who have some degree of fear or aversion to starting down this journey uh, there, there's this common response that says everything that i'm doing today my 
what are currently, I'll just call them contemporary or mainstream agriculture practices, the uses of pesticides and genetically modified crops, and the things that are becoming to be perceived as detrimental to the ecosystem as a whole, they're saying, everything that I'm doing today, I have been told to do by governments. I've been rewarded, I've been incentivized to go down this pathway. And now you're telling me that that's all wrong and you need to change that? Like, I'm not responsible for this. The government and policy and everything pushed me in this direction. So I'm not the guilty party here. I'm not responsible. They are responsible. Yeah, so it's not about who's the guilty party. It's about what kind of life do you want to live? What kind of relationships do you want to have? What kind of farmer do you want to be? And it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some will. It's going to take a choice. Because if you let external powers, external authorities dictate your choices, then you're not actually being fully human. <laughs> you also no longer have the capacity for response. You are no longer right. responsible. You become a functionary. You become a cog in the machine. And we are here actually as creators. Like that's what it's meant really, that we are made in the image of God, of, of exactly. creators. Like we have also God-like capacities, the capacity to create. And if we don't exercise that capacity, we feel like we're not here doing what we were meant to do. You know, we feel like we're not fully alive. We feel like this isn't what I signed up for. So yes, you can validate, yep, this is what the government told you to do. And not just the government, but the economic system. Exactly. And the universities. And here's this, there's a lot of pressure here. And in order to change that, you have to exercise your God-given capacity to create and to, to say, no, this is not what shall be. This is what shall be. And I have my hands and I have my mind that I can implement this new choice. And yeah, and you don't have to go it alone. That's the thing, because now it's not just the lonely rebel who rejects everything that they've been told and farms in a new way. Like there are now, there's now a whole community. There's a whole movement of farmers. And these are not just like, you know, back to the land hippies. These are like fourth, fifth, sixth generation farmers who are going back to the way that their great grandparents or great, great grandparents farmed and reconnecting with that lineage. And so there's a movement, you know, like you don't have to be the crazy one because there are a lot of other people waking up to this. It strikes me that one of the directives that we've been given, if we look at this from a Judeo-Christian worldview perspective, is uh, we are directed, we're commanded to find joy. And when we embrace responsibility, that to me is associated, I see that in people's lives be so strongly associated with finding joy. Over and over, people tell us, farmers tell us that they're having fun, that they're it's so rewarding to engage in, in this process of co-creation with natural ecosystems. And to me, there seems to be this clear association and connection between assuming responsibility and finding joy in our lives, which in today's society, we have not nearly enough of. Yeah. So I'd love to get your perspective on how do we regenerate our capacity to experience and enjoy joy? Yeah, joy has been replaced by consumption, you know. Well, that's a very poor, that's a very poor replacement. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. But, you know, if you don't experience the joy, then, then you know, maybe watch some Netflix or, you know, do something to take your mind off it. Because joy is actually a function of creation. When you watch a child play, they, or children play, you know, they, they create these, these, these worlds together. They play let's pretend. They're creating there are few joys greater than seeing health return to land because of your participation in that process. To see springs come back to life that maybe had been dry since your grandfather's time or your great-grandfather's time. To see bluebirds return, to see the honeybees return, to see the fireflies return. This is, you know, responsibility isn't like some heavy duty that 
calls you to make more sacrifices. It might involve hard work. It probably does involve hard work, but hard work is the way that choice is expressed in this material realm. Like we have bodies, you know, like choices are not choices if they're only happening in your head. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, and but even like the hard work part, you know, like that is a means to an end. It is not a virtue in and of itself. Farming could be a lot less hard when we really restore relationship. I don't know if you've read uh, One Straw Revolution by... Uh, I have. Yeah, Fukuoka. Like, yep. he, he became a better and better farmer and did less and less work because he was so attuned to the, to, to the land that he knew exactly what to do. And it eventually, it eventually arrived to a point where he only planted and harvested, and that was it. Yeah, which is remarkable. Yeah, yeah, and so that's kind of a promise of, of a direction, you know, that that we can go. And also, you know, when you have like I was at my brother's farm a few years ago, he's got about a hundred some acres, and you know, like he's organic, but you know, he was at that time, he was still using a lot of plastic ground cover, you know, like the, the nylon row cover, you know, to keep out the, the hop beetles. And, you know, he was doing like kind of conventional organic practices. And it's not like he was ignorant, you know, I mean, he knew, you know, he knows like what he should be doing. And I was like, John, what, what would it really take for you to farm this land really, really well? And he said, about 200 people, uh -huh. you know, there, there could be 200 people feeding themselves on that land. But we have a system that, that you know, in which 1% of the people farm. And some of that is economic, but also some of that is ideological. A large part ideological, I believe. For centuries, even millennia, it is considered progress to leave the land and enter the world of abstraction. Even 5,000 years ago, the highest status people in society were the king and the priests whose feet were not allowed to touch the ground and lowly became a synonym for bad and high a synonym for good. Superior is better than inferior, right? Well, where, is, where does that prejudice come from? It comes from the social classes that put farmers at the bottom. And so the social attitudes and even the spiritual attitudes went along with it. And it becomes an insult to call somebody a peasant, a villain. A villain originally meant a peasant, to a rube, a hayseed, like all of these slurs uh, for farmers. You know, they're like the only acceptable social slurs anymore, redneck, you know. And really what you're doing when you use, when you think in that way is you're affirming a social hierarchy that puts farmers and farming at the bottom and materiality at the bottom and soil at the bottom and venerates and elevates the people who don't touch the soil and maybe even don't touch material things. They're in the world of abstractions, money and electrons, you know, technology. They're the most highly rewarded. Hedge fund managers make a billion dollars a year. Farmers, you know, they're lucky to make $50,000 a year. Why should that be? So it's not just economic, though. It's also in our social attitudes. And a lot of farmers have internalized that and don't see themselves as doing something noble and important and worthy. But, you know, I think it's time to turn that around. That's part of the return of humanity to accepting our place in the web of life. It's like our, our return to creation. It's the, the fall of the Tower of Babel where, you know, we were aspiring to heaven, to build a tower to heaven. Well, you know what happens in that story? Interestingly, the tower doesn't crash. What happens in the story is that people abandon the project. And they realize that this heaven that they were trying to achieve by climbing to, into the sky is actually here already. It's, it's among us already. It's within us. And the joy you're talking about, like that's a taste of heaven. You know, it's 
available. And, you know. There are many conversations happening uh, now around people who want to create a definition of regenerative agriculture. And I'm not going to elaborate much here. I've given a, several keynote presentations in the, in the last six months on sharing my thoughts on what this should look like. But I think the conversation as it largely uh, is evolving today revolves around defining regenerative agriculture in terms of regenerating soil health. And while I see the allure of that, because soil health is kind of this common denominator for many of the things that we want to achieve, it misses a few very important fundamentals. And the big one for me, I think the fundamental is if we want to have a conversation about regenerating agriculture landscapes at its most fundamental level, we need to regenerate the capacity for stewardship. We need to have 200 people on the land instead of one in the case of your brother's farm example. We need to have more people in the landscape and we need the economic pathways and incentives to exist for them and the rewards to exist for them for regenerating. If, if we truly as a society believe that we need to regenerate to reaffirm our place here on the planet and to embrace in this virtuous cycle of bringing our gifts to the world, then we need to provide the pathway and the means for that to exist. Yeah, right. The economic pathways, the policy pathways, but also the psychological and Indeed. social pathways. You know, like when you read think tanks and futurists and UN bodies predicting what the future is going to be like, one thing that they always take for granted is urbanization. And when they talk about third world countries, they're like, well, you know, Nigeria or, or India or whatever country, you know, half the population live on the land and are farmers. We know that's going to change because they take for granted the trajectory of the United States, where 1% of the people are now engaged in farming. In 1950, it was 10%. In 1900, I think it was 30 or 40%. In 1850, it was maybe 70 or 80%. I'm making all these statistics up, except I do remember 1950, it was 10%. And I think that that concept of progress is obsolete. And we need to reimagine what progress is. A lot of people are already drawn to a new vision of progress. They're already, despite the economic impediments, they're going back to the land anyway. Their parents, you know, got PhDs, you know, and they're going back to the land. They're becoming farmers in direct resistance to the the tide of social and economic this you know the social and economic tide so so people are already drawn to this and we need to express this yearning on a policy level too so that you're not swimming against the tide and you know maybe a healthy society would have 10 percent. maybe that's a good step maybe we should aim as like a as a policy goal to have 10% of the population involved in farming and another 50% having a garden. I mean, that would change our, that would utterly change our society. It would absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know, when we think about what is the, what's the pathway from, from where we are presently to that better future, however that is defined, there is this perspective, this worldview that collectively as a human species, we, we tend to not make the changes that need to be made until we reach a crisis point. If there are collective problems, we need to walk right up to the edge of the cliff and perhaps a few people need to go over the cliff before we can generate the collective willpower to change our reality. And what's the, what's the alternate pathway? I, I, I used to think that uh, crisis was gonna save us that ecological collapse or financial collapse or some kind of mega crisis was going to force us to make the changes that I've always wanted us to make. But I no longer think that. I think that what a crisis does is it offers an opportunity for change. It brings unconscious choices into consciousness and poses us the question, do you want to keep going in this direction or not? COVID did that. It showed us the direction we were heading. Because none of the social changes that we saw during COVID were actually anything new. Social distancing, you know, we'd been becoming more and more distant already. The migration of life online 
uh, meetings, shopping, dating, education, all happening by the computer, that was already a trend. And we were shown like this preview of what the future was going to be if we continued on this trajectory. And because we were shown that in a distilled form, we were offered the opportunity to say yes or no to it. And, you know, are we going to say yes or no to that? We have a choice. We're at a crossroads. And I, you know, I'm exerting all of my power to mm -hmm. choose a return journey from this story of separation that we've been living in. Charles Walters, who was the founder of Acres USA, shared this quote frequently. He would say, people leave their senses as a group and they tend to come to their senses one at a time. And <laughs> I think that probably is generally true. Well, it certainly is true that everyone is on their own individual journey. But what you're describing is that crisis scenarios can bring about an inflection point and bring the subconscious to a conscious level to large groups of a population at any given moment in time. Mm -hmm. And while I certainly don't wish or desire crisis on anyone or any group, I do wish to accelerate that individual journey for lots of people. So what is the pathway? As, as you just shared, you, you are using all your power to facilitate that for our listeners and our audience, what are the things that we can do collectively as a group of individuals to bring about this, this better future that we all know is possible? I don't think it's about doing new things that we haven't been doing. I think everybody listening to this either is already doing what they should be doing or they know what it is and they're maybe not quite ready yet. It would be almost insulting if I said, okay, even though I know nothing about your life, I know what you should be doing. The important thing that I can do and that we as a community can do is to validate the choices that might go against social and economic logic. Because, you know, it's just human nature. You look around and you're like, is this okay to do this? No one else is doing it. But you see other people doing it and they explain why they're doing it and a new culture develops. And really that's what, that's what we need right now is a new culture. So like this podcast, for example, like one of the functions that you serve is that you remind people that they're not crazy. People, as that quote said, they wake up, you know, one individual at a time. But as soon as you wake up, first thing you do is you look around, am I dreaming? Or is this reality shared by others? So, yeah, I'll, I, I want to thank you, John, for uh, doing this work coming from your perspective. And, and it's really important. You know, it's not like I can go to your farm and I can help you do anything <laughs> that needs to be done. I'm not speaking just to you. I'm speaking to everybody listening now. I don't know what needs to be done in your community, in your area, in your place, in your, in, on your soil, um, with your animals, with your plants. I don't know. But I know that you know, and together we can grow that knowledge of knowing. And also, sometimes we don't know. And then it's time to listen and maybe to do nothing, maybe just to observe, to be, to lay fallow. We have to validate that as well. And many of the people listening have been through all parts of this journey. They've maybe been through the fallow time or maybe they're about to enter the fallow time. And if we can hold that as okay, hold that as necessary, and those who have been through that can hold the knowledge that, yeah, there is something on the other side of this. You haven't gone crazy. You haven't become irresponsible. You know what you're doing on a deep level, and maybe we're here to help you. Thank you, Charles. That was quite profound. You know... I've really been looking forward to this conversation and thinking about what are what are some of the topics of conversation that uh, I would like to discuss with you and, and bring to our listeners. These are some of the things that I think about. And but it also I'm very aware that I don't know what I don't know. And so in the spirit of listening, 
and recognizing there's a great deal that you are thinking about that I'm not or that I'm not aware of, what is the question that I should be asking? What is the question that our uh, our listeners should be asking? What are the things that you're thinking about that, uh, what are the questions that I haven't asked? You actually just asked the question <laughs> that should be asked, which is what questions should I be asking? And um, our society offers us an awful lot of solutions. We know the answers to the questions we've been asking, uh, but maybe we're not asking the right questions. And maybe the actual question that needs to be asked hasn't even taken the form of words yet, but we carry it as a disquiet, an unease that in order to keep business as usual going and to you know, maintain our daily lives, we stuff that question down. We ignore the unease, but that unease can be a treasure. It can be a communication from God. You know, it can be the soul speaking to you saying that something about your life is not aligned with your purpose right now. And simply to validate that feeling can already be powerful. And it doesn't mean that you have to solve it right away. It doesn't mean you have to find the right question right away, but simply to say, there is wisdom speaking through my body. There's wisdom speaking through my diagnosis of anxiety or depression or something like that. And I trust that. And I will, as I validate that, as I embrace that, as I accept that, I trust that I will be oriented toward the right questions and toward the right choices going forward. That's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you, Charles. Where can people find out more about your work and connect with you and the work that you're doing? Oh, you know, the usual answer is my website, <laughs> charleseisenstein.org. I write on Substack also, charleseisenstein.substack, I think it's called, .com. You know, you can put the links in your show notes or something. We'll certainly connect to everyone there. Charles, thank you for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom in this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. And I look forward to more conversations in the future. And thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, John. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, Visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.